over 25, we're supposed to find the rate of change. And the rate of change, again, is just the slope. If you're looking at a line and you, and you want to find the rate of change, you're just looking at the slope. Because <coughs> if, we, if we're finding the, the slope, we're finding rise over run. We're finding, are you talking about this, a change in y with a change in x? Did I mention that? Is that wording that I use? <coughs> they talk about delta y and delta x? Yeah? Okay, okay. Well, think about the rise from, from here to there. The rise is just is, is, is from there to there. Like I, I don't necessarily want to know what the y value of this is. I want to know how much did y change from this point to this point. That's what we call delta y. Delta y. Change in y. And also, the horizontal, the run, that's going to be the change in x. Depending on what y is measured in, what x is measured in, we then get a rate of change of one kind of a thing to another kind of a thing. In dollars, in hours, in meat, in feet per second, whatever those units are, we get a rate of change. Okay. So in this example, I don't know if anybody has their book. Let me just jump back over here. Um, for 25, x is measured in gallons, y is measured in miles. Okay. So miles and gallons. So when we use that y2 minus one, y1 over x2 minus x1, we'll wind up with a rate of change of what per what? Miles per gallon. If at one time I had, let's see, I had gone, let's see, I used, let's say I used zero gallons and I was 11 miles away from something. Right? So I'm, I, I've used zero gallons, but I'm 11 miles away from it, let's say. Does that make sense? And it's in gallons of, of, of gas, I imagine. It's not like water or something. Zero gallons of gas, we're, but we started 11 miles away from home. Right? Later on, we uh, take some readings, and we have used three gallons, and we are 50 miles away from home. And if you find the slope between those two, you can figure out how many miles per gallon we're getting. So we'll take the 50 minus 11. This tells us how far we've gone. It's in miles. And we'll take the 3 minus 0. That'll tell us the gallons we've used. So 50 minus 11, 39 <laughs> over 3. So 39 miles to 3 gallons. Thirteen miles per one gallon. We can simplify that that fraction. A lot of times, though, when we want to find the unit rate, even if it came out to be like thirty-nine miles per five gallons, even though that fraction doesn't simplify, if we're talking about a rate of change, we want to figure out what are the miles per gallon, meaning miles per one gallon. We kind of force this to get divided by five. This was divisible by three, so that was a nice convenient thing. We get 13 miles per gallon. Even if it's not divisible, if you want to know miles per gallon or feet per second or miles per hour or anything like that, just go ahead and divide. Right? What is 39 divided by five? Okay, calculator. 7.8 miles per gallon. Every mile I go, I will use 7.8 gallons. Or no. A gallon I'll use, I'll be able to go 7.8 miles. <coughs> That's worth this it's, yeah, not very good. It's like a giant SUV that needs a tune-up. Kind of work out of mileage you're getting. Worse than 7.8? I get 80. That's a little better than 7.8. Yeah. Oh, oh worse. But it's worse than that for sure. I was talking about the 13. This is not where you're getting about either. the 7.8. I never even thought of it. Hopefully we're talking about somebody who is uh, is running and drinking lots of water. Maybe that's what it's about. They're drinking, they're drinking a gallon every time they run 13 miles. That's pretty good. Sweat it out. Okay. So we'll do 65 now. And that'll be the last one unless someone changes their mind. So there will be water in the place yeah. quite a bit.
the not too distant future, we will be writing these equations. But they give us an equation. It would be nice to understand what that equation means. We're participating in a 14 mile run walk. Right? So in all, you're going to have gone a distance of 14 miles. Uh, but you run some and you walk some. You run part way at 6 miles per hour and walk part way at 3.5 miles per hour. The model for this situation is well, 6 miles an hour times the number of hours that you run plus 3.5 miles an hour times the number of hours that you walk, and all of that will add up to 14 miles. And we could run and walk for different times. And it all varies depending on how tired we get after running for a while. Okay. R is the amount of time that you run, and W is the amount of time that you walk in hours. It's gotta be in hours. If it weren't in hours, then like if it were minutes, that wouldn't work very well. You can't multiply miles per hour by minutes and expect to get much of anything. So we're going to graph the equation and give three possible combinations of running and walking times. Graph this guy. Do you think we should graph over here? No. Why not? Because that's walking negative. Yeah, the negative time, right? Negative r, negative w, we're really even down here. We shouldn't even concern ourselves with that. We're not going to walk for negative time, right? So let's not worry about that. Let's just worry about positive. Uh, well, it doesn't really matter. Is this the r axis or the w axis? It could be either. Any one you want. R, w. So to graph a line, remember it's just a game of what are the easiest points to find. What are the easiest points we could find the quickest right off? <coughs> What's that? Y intercept. Y intercept, how do we find that? Or the, uh, the W intercept, maybe? Yeah. How do we find the W intercept? Plug in zero for R. Right. The, the, where we touch this axis, well, if we're on the axis, we're not to the left of it, we're not to the right of it. To the left would be negative R's, to the right would be positive R's. Right in the middle of negative and positive numbers is the number zero. So plug in z zero for R, we get 3.5 W equals 14. Been solving equations for a while. We should know how to solve w these equations. Four. What's that? W equals, four. w equals 4 because we divided 14 by 3.5. Okay, so W equals 4. Uh, three, 4. There we go. Well, another easy one would be plug in 0 for W. Solve for R. <coughs> okay. Plug in 0 for W, we get 6R equals 14. And R equals whatever 14 divided by 6 is. 1.75. Oh, 1.75, excuse me. 1, 2.75. No? No, it's 2.3. 2.3. No. Oh, I'm sorry, I read, I read the wrong one on my paper. Okay. So this is at 0, comma 4, and this is at 2.3. So we give three possibility, three possible combinations of running and walking times. What's that? So anywhere on that line. Yes, absolutely. Anywhere on this line, because this line is just made of what? Points. Millions and billions of points. Right? All the possible combinations of walking and running time. And if I plug in a certain uh, running time, I can figure out how much walking time we need to make up the rest of the 14 miles, right? I can even do it the other way. I can plug it in, in walking time and get running time, right? And that point, that is right there, it's on the line. If I put in this R, I'll get this W, that point's on the line as well. That line is all of the points. Um, so I want three possibilities. Do we have any possibilities already? Two of them. We have two possibilities, okay? What's one of them? Four hours of walking. Four hours of walking, zero hours of running. Okay? So four hours walking uh, and zero hours running. Right. We've got this other possibility here. We could run the entire time for 2.3 hours. 
2.3 hours running. When that begins, this though, because it says that you walk part way, which doesn't mean you have to do at least some distance walking. Uh, let's see. You run part way. Why do you walk part way? I don't know. If we're being mathematically technical, we could say the part that you walk is zero. Like that's a part of it. So I don't know. But uh, yeah, like. If you told somebody that I run, I ran part way and I walked part way, well, how much did you uh, run? Not any. And they would think that was kind of silly to say. Mathematically, these are acceptable answers, but that's a good point. You know, reading the English, it certainly seems like neither one of these should actually be zero. Oh, but that's fine. These zeros are okay. But let's say we need one more. If we're Nathan, we need three more right now because don't really have any. Just Why don't we use the take the 14 minus 3 of you uh -huh. and then figure out what r is? We could. Uh, so we could take 6r equals uh, 14 minus 3w, 3.5w. But then how do we figure out what r is? <laughs> Plug in something for W. Plug in something for W. You could also. <laughs> you could also just leave it this way. Plug something in for W, and you'll have to wind up subtracting whatever that is anyway. I mean, either way, you want to go. Just plug in something for something and figure out what the other something is. Let's go with this because it's already, well, almost all the way set up for R. We'll plug in, uh, I think, something divisible by 2 is probably a good idea. 2. Two. Okay, we'll put in two. All right. And what's uh, 3.5 times two? Seven. Seven. 14 minus seven is seven. Six R equals seven. R equals seven sixths. Okay. So seven sixths of an hour is spent running and two hours is spent walking. There's another possibility. How many possibilities are there? How many possibilities do we have is three? How many possibilities are there that exist? Infinite. An infinite number. Because we could put in, we could go two hours, 2.1 hours, 2.01 hours, 2.0001 hours. We could just keep putting in as minute differences we want to. All right. What's everybody's deal this morning? I feel like it's Friday. Weightlifting made you tired. Oh, it's Friday. Yeah, wake, no, I didn't wait. I was tired. Waking up at, at about six o'clock. Yeah. I don't. I don't cry for you, Argentina. I woke up much earlier than that. It's okay. Time to wake up early. Early. Yeah, he gets here at six o'clock. How much coffee did you get? I had two cups. <coughs> All right. Does that mean we're ready to take the review? We're pros at this? Okay, stop me if that's not the case, but if it is the case, pass in your homework and make sure your desk looks like this, without this, or this, or this, only with these, which you should all have already, you don't even need to get up. You're all, all ready to go. <laughs> so the uh, lines of parallel perpendicular are neither, of course, a not the way that this will not work is to just graph points, draw lines, and guess as to whether they are perpendicular or perpendicular, parallel or neither. Okay? Because our graphs are not perfect, and never will be. And even if you did have a perfect graph, I could draw two lines with a supercomputer, with a high resolution screen, and all this kind of stuff that look parallel but aren't because their slopes are so close, but they're not. So what we need to do is find out exactly what the slopes are because parallelness and perpendicularness have to do with how well, slanted the lines are compared to each other. And the measure of slantiness is the slope, right? Are we going to make got to find the slope, find the slope of each line. So find the slope of line one. How's that going to go? Negative one minus six. Great. 
Yes. Over negative 3 minus 2. Perfect. Negative 7 over negative 5. Positive 7 over 5. Right? Negative divided by negative is positive. It's a positive fraction. Okay. 1, 2. Exact same thing. You do 0 minus 5 over 4 minus 3. <coughs> 5, 7, 5, Yes? Okay. Well, I'll just always wonder what Jeff might have said that day. Uh, so what do we conclude? Parallel, perpendicular, or neither? Jethro? Neither. Exactly. Was I trying to trick you a little bit? Yeah, you were. Uh, it didn't work. I was trying to trick you into thinking that they were what? Right. That's the opposite reciprocals. They're reciprocals, but they're not opposite reciprocals. Now, if they were opposite reciprocals, we would have some perpendicular lines. Yes. So, what's, like, what would make that perpendicular? So, they're, they, they're not really even close to being perpendicular as lines. But if we had done this math out and somehow wound up with like a negative 5 over a positive 7, then we'd have seven fifths and negative five sevenths, and maybe perpendicular. Right. Or if we had done all the math, we came up with five over negative seven. So that would still be a negative fraction. We still have negative five sevenths as a, as a slope, and we would have seven fifths and negative five sevenths. Does that make sense? Sort of. But I'll ask questions later. Uh, okay. Let's pretend. Let's do some pretending. Will it have to be the same, Mike? You know, like 7 over 5, and what had to be uh, and negative 7 over 5, and in uh, the, uh, the second line to be perpendicular, or does it just have to be negative? I think I didn't quite catch all of your questions. Well, like, what I'm saying is that, just, uh, do they both have to come out like, uh, come out 7 over 5? Uh, like, you know, line 1 is 7 over 5, well, line 2, well, it have to, to make it perpendicular, it would have to be negative 7 over 5? Yes. So uh, let me give you some examples of, of slopes that are opposite reciprocals, and therefore lines that they have the slope to be perpendicular. So let's use these 7 fifths, negative 5 sevenths. These two slopes are opposite reciprocals, so their lines would be parallel, the lines that they are the slopes on. Uh, 3 fourths and negative 4 thirds. Opposite reciprocal slopes, so the lines would be perpendicular. Okay. Uh, how about one half? Yeah. Negative two. Negative two. Negative two. Why negative two? Negative two over one. Right. Two over one is a reciprocal of one half. It's the opposite. Negative three elevenths. It's the opposite reciprocal of that. Positive eleven thirds. So all these are examples of slopes that are opposite reciprocals. So the lines that have these slopes would be parallel to each other. Parallel to each other, parallel, or sorry, perpendicular, 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 perpendicular. I don't know if I accidentally said parallel at any moment, but I'm talking about perpendicular the entire time. Yes. Can slopes ever be a mixed number, or do they always have to be a proper fraction? Uh, if they're a mixed number, then it's kind of hard to yeah. interpret them. I mean, you could write it that way, like, what, uh, four yeah, thirds. It's easiest as an improper fraction, but I don't want to ever lead you to believe that something is wrong when it's not wrong. It's just maybe not conventional, okay? Um, I'd like to get, like 11 thirds. This is improper, right? And it's positive, so it's a little easier to talk about. So this would be three and two thirds. Well, how do I make sense of that when I go to use it as a slope? It's doable, right? I could kind of think of it as, Three and two thirds over one. So this could be the rise, and this could be the run. You could do that with anything. Right? That would even work as eleven thirds. I could just do eleven thirds over one, up eleven thirds over one. These are kind of inconvenient things to do. It'd be easiest just to turn it back into a proper easiest, not correct, but easiest to turn it back into a proper fraction. Uh, this. Okay. So let me try and work one out real quick that happens. You know, when we do it to come out. Opposite reciprocals, and so the lines would be perpendicular to each other. Uh, maybe I can get some help from somebody in the audience. Two, 
one. Okay, so I want to pick two points that will give me a slope that will be opposite reciprocal that will make a line perpendicular. Right? So I want another set. And then we'll just work it out together. What's the slope between these two points? Negative four. <coughs> negative four over what? Negative five. Negative five, so positive four fifths. Notice when I take a negative divided by negative, I get positive, just like negative times negative is positive. Negative times negative is positive, negative divided by negative is positive. Because if you think about it, this is really negative four times negative one-fifth, right? Negative four times negative one-fifth, so you get a positive number. Right? So then this guy has to come out to be what? Negative. Negative. Five-fourths, yeah? Negative five-fourths. Let's say we can make this point anything, and negative 7, 12. Okay. Well, here's what has to happen. Like this. We have to do the subtraction here between this y and this y and come out with 5. Or we have to come out with negative 5. Do we just have to choose. What do we choose? Positive 2. Make this 2? No, the other one. No, I'm talking about this one. Or we change focus. Yes? I would say you do 7. 7. 7 minus 12, negative 5. Okay? So now we, we do have a negative 5 as our rise. What does the run have to come out to be? 4. What does negative over negative come out to be? Positive. positive. So the, the, the run has to come out as? Four. Positive 4. All right. So how do we get that to come out to be positive 4? Negative 9. Negative 3. Do 7 minus 12, we get negative 5. We have to do something minus 7, well, or minus negative 7. Minus negative 7. Four. Take negative 3 minus negative 7. Negative, negative 3. Right? Negative 3. Negative. Negative 3 minus negative 7. Negative 5. Now, negative 3 plus 7, now that gets us into the positive territory. 4. Negative 5 over positive 4, we've got an opposite reciprocal slope, so we have perpendicular lines. Let's look at it another way. Okay, how do we get this negative 5? We did 7 minus 12. Now, these two points, if there's a line that goes through these two points, it should have a slope of negative 5 plus. Let's do it differently. Let's do it the other way, 12 minus 7. Over, well if I do 12 minus 7, I need to do negative 7 minus negative 3. Right? Yes? Yep. All good? Okay. Well, what do we get here? 12 minus 7 is positive 5. So in the denominator, what do we wind up with? Negative 7 plus 3 is negative 4. Negative divided by positive is a negative number Positive divided by negative is a negative number. The fraction overall is negative. This is a really common thing. This negative here, does it mean it goes with the 5 or it goes with the, with the 4? What's the answer to that? Uh, it doesn't matter, as long as it only goes with one of them. If we're with both the numerator and denominator, if we have a negative in the numerator and denominator, we're dividing a negative number by a negative number, and we get a positive number. But here we're doing negative divided by positive, or positive divided by negative. Either way, we get a negative number. Okay? And in this case, these two points, we have perpendicular lines. We have opposite reciprocal slopes. And we have that little proof that I drew, right? Of two perpendicular lines, and I proved to you that if one of them has A over B, then the other slope has to be negative B over A. If you haven't seen that, then uh, the, the, the lecture video has it in it, or just the plain old tutorial videos on the other playlist. Uh, it also has that same explanation. So take a look at that. All right, so uh, we're looking at the slope uh, from line one in, the qu in question one. So that's this guy right here. Let's grab it. That would be this one. So 
So we're looking at the slope from line one in question one, seven fifths slope. Right. Which which one of these came from x and which one of these came from the y's? Bottoms x, tops y. Rise over run, rise is vertical, y is vertical. Run, it's horizontal, x is horizontal. Rise over run. Change in y over change in x. We talked about delta y over delta x at the beginning of the class. All of those things. So those are y's and these are x's. So if x were measured in years and y were measured in inches, what would be the rate of change of y relative to x? Yes? You just 7 fifths inches per year. You got it. Or 7 inches per 5 years. Rather, I go 7 fifths of an inch every 1 year, 7 inches every 5 years, that ratio is the same. Or if I take 7 divided by 5, what's 7 divided by 5? 1.4 inches. 1.4 inches per year. Right? A lot of times when we talk about rates of change, especially like miles an hour, or gallons per mile, or miles per gallon, any of those, we'll usually write it as a, as a decimal. Because it's just, it's communicated more easily to someone if I say 1.4 inches per year. Now I can get a grasp of what you're talking about. If I tell you seven inches in five years, or seven fifths of an inch, or seven fifths, in, seven fifths of an inch in a year, or seven inches in five years, it's hard to draw a picture of that in your head, right? One point four inches per year, I can imagine that. It's really slow, right? Something moving seven point or one point four inches per year. What might move that slowly? Glaciers move really, really slowly. I don't think sloths move that slowly. Um, yeah. The walking rocks in Sand Park that yeah. Yeah, they're called walking rocks, people so don't really understand why they move, but they have yeah, 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 they, yeah, yeah, they yeah, they yeah. Ice crystals oh. that form, um, what happens is it creates just enough water for the rocks to shift with those tiny, right. minute movements of the water. So as the water freezes underneath it uh, throughout the year, it can move a little bit further. Uh, so like the ice. So that is slow. That is very slow. And you can see the tracks behind it. Talks about the distance the moon gets further away from the Earth every year. One point four inches. It's fairly. Close. It's really slow. It is getting farther away. Yeah. So things can move that slowly. One point four inches per year. Hawaii moves a little bit faster than this. It moves about four inches per year towards Japan. Okay. So there we go. There's a rate. Of, if you have this, or you have this, or you have this, any of those things conveys a rate of change. A rate of change. Every five years we go seven inches. Uh, every year we go seven fifths of an inch. Every year we go 1.4 inches. So following equations and label the line of seven inch. So we need to draw some graphs. Just get disappeared now. We have just one to graph for both of the lines. Sure. Okay, so Remember, this is just a game of finding two points, because we are graphing the easiest graph that there is to graph, besides a single point. Okay, we pass that just a line. Straight line is the easiest thing we can possibly graph. And how many points do we need to draw a line? Three. Two. One's not enough. Two is. Two is enough. Three is more than enough. It's not too many. It's just more than we need to do. So we need to find two points, and it's a game of how do we find the easiest two points. Let's look at this one. What's like the easiest point to find? Well, x equals zero. Plug zero in for x. Yeah, that's really easy to do. Plug zero in for x, and y will be yeah, negative yeah. three. Yeah. So way we have negative three. So zero for x. That means not over here, not over here, but right here. <laughs> negative three. Negative three. Right. Will be the next easiest point to find. Next easiest. Value to plug in for x. One multiple of times over one. Okay. A multiple of six. A multiple of six would I think be easier because with a one, if we plug a one in there, we're gonna get five six. We're gonna have to find common denominators, but if I put in a six, y equals well, that's six over one. We get cross cancellation. We get five minus three. 
2. Y is 2. So x is 6. Here's x. And here's y, obviously. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And 2. 6 over 5. Yeah, what? 6 over 5. Oh, we can plug in 6 over 5. That would make it pretty easy because we get 1 there. The only problem with that is then I have to, x is 6 over 5 and I have to graph the fraction 6 over 5. Oh, yeah. Right? You've got to think about the graphing. But certainly it would work, right? We get 6 fifths, so that would be uh, 5, 6 fifths, and we would get 1 minus 3, which would be negative 2. And that is also correct. Just a, a little harder. And my guess of where 6 fifths is it might not be very good. Um, so, just connect those two points. And if we did enough of these, just over and over and over, and it was our job to do this eight hours a day, uh, but you know, we got paid per graph. Let's say we got paid per graph, not per hour. We got paid per graph that we pumped out. We want to do the graphs as fast as possible. I would just notice, hey, plug in zero always, I'll always get this number right here. It's in this form. Plug in zero, get that number. Plug in zero, get that number. Zero, get that number, whatever the case, whatever the equation is, right? So we start to notice this guy is a point on the y-axis. If I go, just go on the y-axis to this place, that'll always be valid. Because I can always plug in zero, eliminate that term, and I get this number right there. So that's what we call what? The y-intercept. Right? And every time I plug in 6 or 12 or... 18 or 24, and I just keep plugging in multiples of 6. I'm going to add 5 more. If I plug in 12, I would be adding 12 more. If I plug in 18, I'd be adding 3 more. What am I saying? I'd be adding 5, I'd be adding 10, I'd be adding 15. Right? Every time I put in another multiple of 6, I add a multiple of 5. Yes? Why do you have to plug in a number for x? Can you just like, do random or this is exactly what I'm explaining right now. Okay. Right? We can just take this as the y-intercept yeah. because easy. Plug it, really, essentially what we're doing is plugging in 0 and getting the y value that just lands on the y-axis. And then if I do rise over run and go up 5 and over 6, I'm just kind of explaining it in reverse where I go over 6, right, to x is 6 because 6 is the denominator here that I want to cancel out. Over 6 and I'm just going to obviously add 5, because that 6 is going to cancel that 6, and we're left with a 5, we're add 5 to negative 3, over 6, up 5 from there, or rise over run. Right. So that's what I was saying, when you use our imagination, imagine we get paid per graph here, we're going to do it as quickly as possible. If it's in this form, it's really fast to say, that's going to be on the y-axis. And I can just move over 6 and up 5, or up 5 and over 6. Either way, I'm going to get it. That ain't good money. Well, not if you got a fraction of all right, so easy, right? Those are the easiest two points that we can find if it's in that form. But if it's in this form, what would be like the easiest way to find two points? Plug in zero for x and then plug in zero for y. All right, this is two, not at the same time, right? This is two different events. We plug in zero for x, find y. That's done. Plug in zero for y, find x. That'll be give us two points. We're going to find this point, 0 comma something, and something comma 0. So we plug in 0 for x, we get 3y equals 21, and y equals <coughs> 7. All right, another time. We plug in 0 for y, we get 7x equals 21. So x equals 3. And we have two points, that's it, we're done. We just graph the line between those two points, and we will have captured all of them possibly have added. So 0, 7, and 3, 0. I can plug in 1 for x, I can plug in 2 for x, 4 for x, 5 for x, 7 for x, but all I'll be doing is landing somewhere on this line. And then, uh, okay. Any questions about that? Teacher today? Good. Makes sense. Did you have something? I was wondering if, if someone, if they don't complete it in the time given, 
then you just give them zero out of five or oh, one. Oh, I would. Five. I mean, if they started, it's got to be worth something, right? Yeah. And it's and it's based on this. I mean, I know it may be because we didn't have enough time, but what does it look like? The skills. What's the level of the skills is displayed? Right. It was pretty good work, and they made a bit of progress. And you can tell they're, they're on the right track. They're on the right track. Right. If if the person just stopped because they didn't know what to do next, that's kind of what a three is. They're not sure what to do next. Right. They're making the right progress, or they're making some. Uh, some conceptual mistakes, right? That's in the three range. See, a lot of those are three. Alright, I'm saving for the box set of a, of, of a TV show. It's $180. And two jobs, two different jobs. One pays $6,000 now, the other $10. Function represents how many hours you need to work at each job to be able to afford a box set. So give two solutions to this equation. I, I could have not given you all of that explanation and just said, give two solutions to this equation. You don't need all that setup. But you can see the method, the process <coughs> behind what makes this equation. How are we going to find a solution to this equation? Plug in zero for x and then find y and then plug in zero for y and find x. Alright. So let's talk about what would we get a solution. So zero for x, zero for x gives us what for y? 18. And zero for y gives us what for x? 30. Now let's talk about how it relates back to this problem here. This is x and this is y. What does x represent? The hours at the six dollar an hour job. And what does Y represent? Hours at the ten dollar an hour job. So what does this solution, right? And by solution I mean if you plug in this for X and plug in this for Y, both sides of the equation should come out the same. What does it represent? That's right. Um, it represents how many hours you have to work for each job. Right. How many hours you're gonna spend at six dollar an hour job, how many hours you'd spend at ten dollar an hour job? So if I didn't go to the one job at all, but I just went to the better paying job, well, that'd be kind of like the fastest way to do it, right? The less time I spend at the better paying job, the longer it's gonna take. And this would be about the worst way to do it, the slowest way to do it. I gotta work 30 hours to at the, the worst paying job, uh, and no hours at the best paying job. Any questions about that at all? I know the show. I I meant thing it says now is that how many hours you need to work in, it, in each job. Yes. So you have to work at both jobs. Work at, yeah, we're gonna have to put hours for both jobs to get one in. Yeah, zero hours. Zero hours. How much did I work at the one job? No hours at all. <laughs> but um, also for the six hour job and stuff like that, and yep. if you wanted to put hours for both jobs and stuff like work in a couple hours. Any job that you and any hours you do, you'd have to have like at least five hours, uh, at least five hours for the six job. Why at least five? Why not just? Has to be it has to be five, uh, five or multiple uh, five uh, five ten to make it so you can actually get a uh, the right amount for ten. Well, assuming that we can work fractions of hours, if we can work fractions of hours, decimals of hours, we can put anything we want. Sure. Right? Like you just put. I worked one hour at this job. How many hours do I work at this job? Well, I'm not going to guess. I'll figure it out. Yeah. 180, 10y equals 174, y equals 17.4 hours that I have to work. What job pays like that? Yes? What if they only gave one oh. solution? Well, I guess that'd be like three or four out of five. Because it did ask. Score them all out of five, total out of five. <coughs> pass it back, take a look, and pass it in. Okay, take a look at this equation. Just to think about it for a second, you don't have to really do anything. It's a very simple equation, right? I'm going to start with, I don't know of a more simple algebraic equation to solve than this one. 
doesn't get much easier. Here is a warning from the future. I've been to your future many times. Okay? It's called later in the year and previous years that I taught. Okay? Because I am about to get you started on how we solve equations. I know you solve algebraic equations before. I hope so. We were in a class called algebra already. So you solve some equations. <coughs> the, the thing that I do not want you to fall into is ignoring what I'm telling you about how to solve equations in general and say, eh, I get this easy answer. Right? You have to start with good habits and the foundation. If you just say, I can see that it's 16. Right? I can just see it. If you ever said that to yourself or to your teacher when they ask you to show your work or to your parents and they say, how did you do this? And you say, oh, I just see the answer. Unless you're some kind of a savant who can, I don't know, fly, take a 20 minute flight over New York and then recreate the, the, the skyline perfectly uh, because your memory is like just that good and you just see it, unless you're that guy, you don't just see it, okay? You're actually doing the math in your head, but you're not, Getting it down into like a, an approach that you give, the same approach to every equation. Right? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I know you can see a 16. Nobody's impressed. Right? We all know a 16. <laughs> <laughs> and as, as silly as it seems, adding four to both sides is what I want you to get in the habit of doing. Maybe get into good habits right now, because if you don't start there, then you know if we start with once we get to this point, okay, can you just see the answer to that? Can you find the solution to that one? In like 10 seconds, I will. Okay, 10, I'll give you 10 seconds. No, after I write it down. Uh, write it down and I'll give you 10 seconds. Go ahead. Oh, jeez. Challenge stated, challenge accepted. <coughs> So you're saying you try to plug something in for x and then get it to be zero, but you got a decimal answer. No, because I, I added five to the other side yes. and divided by two. Yeah, I'm wrong. Good, oh, yeah. good like I'm things wrong. to try. That's not the way we approach this kind of problem, but you can never understand how we approach this kind of problem if you don't <coughs> understand how we approach this kind of problem algebraically. Not intuitively, algebraically. Okay? The skill set from algebra, from big bosses in algebra who have set up a really nice approach for us so that we can pave the way to an equation like this. By the way, if you're thinking the answer to this is like 1, negative 2, if I could just guess the right integer, I would have it. There's two answers for one thing. One of them is this. The other one is this. <coughs> Guessed one of those at some point. Oh, if you yeah. say yes, you would have get. Come on, uh, you I never would have guessed one either one of those. I would have gotten it. I got. I got, I got that. Thing. You know, the second one in about. Uh, five it was seconds. on the tip of my tongue. Yeah, or I'll be in real funny. After going through books. So, so no, you thing. never would have guessed it. It's not a guessable solution, right? And even if you got close, you would be guessing like decimals and stuff. This is a, this is <coughs> decimals that never end. You're never going to guess that by using a decimal. This is exactly these would be exactly right solutions to this equation. You'll never get there. <coughs> you just say, I'm not going to add four to both sides because I can just see a 16. Right? So each step of the way, please, I beg of you, don't just say, I see it, I just write the answer, pay attention, start by adding four to both sides, divide by something on both sides, multiply by the reciprocal of fractions. Right? Even today, the answer, the solution to the equation, may be beyond your ability to just see it and actually bet on it. It's going to be beyond your ability to just guess, at least in a reasonable amount of time. All right? So the work may be a little bit 
it take a little bit longer to add four to both sides and figure out that it's 16, then it would just be to look at it and say, oh, it's 16. But by the time you get over here, the time it would take to guess the right solution, it's almost infinite to guess the right solution. Right. So just putting a little more work now so that it's a lot less work later to find these solutions. Huh? Because technically it is infinite time because it's an infinite decimal. Yes, but if you were to guess th this exact answer, negative 2 plus the square root of 24 divided by 2, and you were to plug that in for the, all these values, it would come out exactly right. It would come out to exactly 0. But only if you guessed exactly this. But yeah, you're right. If you start doing decimals, you'll never do it. It'll be infinite. So that's my, uh, my anti-commercial for guessing and checking. It's an anti-commercial, meaning I don't want you to do that. Guessing and checking. It's a nice way to start. Sometimes I'll have you guess and check. So we can work our way to just finding straightforward a solution to these equations. All right? That one won't be for quite a while. We don't have to worry about it anytime soon. Let's just worry about linear equations. We'll solve those. But let's approach them the way an algebraist would approach it. Okay? All right, so we're talking about equations. The thing that we need to realize about equations is that an equation Let's just start with the simplest. This is an equation, right? How is this like an equation? Huh? How is this like an equation? You put an input in on this side and you get the output on the other. Okay, we could set up an equation like that. We, we could have inputs on both sides and outputs on both sides. Like, we can make a complicated equation. But yeah, like, I. I could put stuff here. All right, somebody. It's like we have a little canister. Like I'm trying to figure out, there's, there's stuff in there, right? Like I'm trying to figure out how many um, of these are in there. Let's do that. This. Oh, that's not working. In there. Not a perfect scale, but well, it looks balanced, right? Well, there's two of them in there, right? So, okay, except for the canister itself weighs something, but I think there's actually one of them in there. But we kind of count the canister as one, and add another one, and so it's, it's like two. Okay. It's not perfect. It's not it's not perfectly mathematical, but it gives you the idea. <coughs> I won't have this out for long. The point I want to make here is if I take this guy away, what have I done to the equation? It's uneven. It's uneven. It's not balanced on both sides. I've made this side lighter. I've subtracted one. What do I need to do over here if I want to make it balanced? Add one. Subtract one. If I add one to this side and subtract one from this side, no, no, no. that's like taking two away from this side. No. You subtract I would need to subtract two. So let me kind of set it up so that I could actually do that. So, how many are over here? Do you remember how many? Three. Two. Three. I'm going to put another one on here just now. What's over here? Three. Two plus a canister. Just one plus a canister. Um, one plus a canister. Okay. So, one plus a canister, call canister X, right? They got yeah, X written on the front there. So, what equation could this represent? X plus one equals three. X plus one equals three. Okay, fairly simple, about as simple as this one. Now I know that x plus one equals three would mean that x has to be two, but again, it's about building a strong foundation. Right? So if I want to figure out how much this x is worth, well, I don't want this guy, I just want the canister on the one side. Right? So I'll take one away from both sides, 
and now it's still balanced because I removed the same amount from both sides. Does that make sense? And I now know because it's balanced that x is worth two of these, and x is two. Point is, that's why we do the same thing to both sides. Not because we have been taught well and, and we remember that we're supposed to do the same thing to both sides, but because if we don't do the same thing to both sides, what we now have is not an equation. It's not equal. This is first state paperwork that hasn't been turned in yet. You guys up till Monday, you lose your computer privileges. Sides. Why? Because doing the same thing to both sides maintains the balance. Don't put on that. Maintain the balance. Don't do something unequal on both sides. Do an equal thing to both sides. Subtract something from both sides that's the same. Subtract or add the same thing to both sides. Right? Add weight that's equal to both sides. Cut both sides in half. Cut both sides down by a factor of three. Multiply both sides by five. Make both sides five times as big as they were. But in that way, you'll make will maintain the quality between both sides. So what are we going to do? Both sides, at least x by itself, and that's it. And then whatever's on the other side, that's what x is. Right? How are we going to get x by itself and just like get rid of the stuff that's with x? You guys know. Go ahead. Is this equation? Yes, this equation. Oh, yeah, add, add, add 4 to both sides. What's negative 4 plus 4? One. Zero. X equals 16. Right? So 10 minutes later, we know what we do just by looking at it, that it's 16. Let's just get a little more complicated. Not that much more complicated. 12X equals 144. Don't guess and check. Don't plug in numbers for X until you get 144 when you multiply by 12. Should we do it like that? <laughs> yeah, we have 12 times as much as we want, right? We want 1x. We have 12x's. Let's find out what 1 12th of this is. And 1 12th of this would be what 1x is worth. Try this one. 4x equals 15. What have you done? What is x? Go ahead. It's all yours. terminates, if it doesn't repeat forever, then let's go ahead and write that as well. Three and three fourths. What's that? Three and three fourths. Three and three fourths. We could write that as a mixed number, or we could write it as 3.75. All, all good. Let's put a couple of these things. up front. If 
you were to do the reverse of the order of operations, and that would be a good idea. It's not really a good way to think, I know. Try something, do it correctly, and, and progress. Right? That's not the only way to do it. You don't have to do the reverse of order of operations, but it certainly would get you there. The way I learned this, it's not necessarily a reverse of order of operations, but it's whatever the farthest away from X is. Like physically as far away? Well, like sometimes like sometimes seven times X will be written out differently, so it'll be farther away, but like, uh, you know, you have to think of it like that, seven X plus nine, which is farther away. Yeah, because ultimately it's, it's the same thing. <coughs> What's gonna happen to X first? It's gonna get multiplied by seven. What's gonna happen after that? Nine. So if I wanna figure out, like go backwards and figure out what, what X is, I'll take nine away from that number that got multiplied by seven, and I'm gonna divide that number by seven. We can really do it in any order we want. Here would be the most ideal. Great. Fast, quick, we could do other things like. Divide by seven first? Yes. We can't. But we can't do it incorrectly. If we do it incorrectly, then it's incorrect. Right? If I'm going to divide by seven, what's the rule of thumb every time? Do the same thing to both sides, not just a part of the side. So if I just divide this by seven, I have not divided the left of the equation by seven. If I'm going to divide the left side of the equation by seven, I've got to divide everything by seven. This by seven as well. Yeah, I get, well. Things that are not so nice. Seven x divided by seven, that's just x. Right? That's just x, that's fine. Then I get nine divided by seven equals 30 divided by seven. Okay, that's fine, it's correct. What do we do next? Finish the division. Does it mean I get decimals? We don't want decimals. Let's stay in exact answers. Subtraction. Subtraction. And it's not that bad, right? Because they already have common denominators. Okay, so that's good. X equals 30 sevenths minus 9 sevenths is 21 sevenths. And that's still 3. Of course, it's still the same answer. X has to be 3. To satisfy this equation, X has to be 3. Otherwise, it won't work. Again, don't guess and check. Don't just try and see it. At this point, if you're trying to see it, you're just guessing and checking. One, no, that didn't work. Two, no, three, oh, it worked. But for something like, something that needs a fraction answer, a fraction solution, uh, it's not going to work there. 3x minus 12 equals five. The solution to this is some fraction. If you just Run around trying fractions, you'll get there eventually, I'm sure of it, but let's start. Good habits, add both sides, crack both sides, divide both sides, multiply both sides, by the reciprocal, all that kind of stuff. Maybe a minute? All right, looking good. No idea where you guys are on this. We add 12 to both sides. He's having really trouble with that, but I can see. Divide by 3 on both sides, x equals 17 over 3 exactly, right? Because if I do the division and I get x equals 5.6, is that right? No, it's not right. Huh? Uh, he works around 5.7. Okay, around 5.7. Is that right? 5.6. Okay, so if I do this... Correct. But it shows me that you're afraid of fractions, probably. Okay. Most of the time when I see an answer like that, and it's just out of context, like there's no, it's not a thing. Like it's not 17 thirds of a mile, 17 thirds of a gallon, 17 thirds of a candy bar. So I don't need to be told it's about 5.6 or 5.7 because it's not a thing. It doesn't really matter. It's just a number. Okay. This number is exactly right. This number is also conceptually exactly right if I repeat six forever. Okay. This is perfectly fine. <coughs> Four, three, and two thirds is perfectly, or 
five and two thirds. Is as well. Yeah. Okay. I still don't understand how you get point six ten for two thirds, yet you don't get point nine for two thirds. You do. You do. Yeah. Yeah. You do. <laughs> Just gonna say the point nine repeating is equal to one or two thirds. Okay. Well, we'll just leave that that. So leave that there. Leave that alone. Um, precisely because of what you just said, right? One third is 0.3 repeating, two thirds is 0.6 repeating, three thirds, 0.9 repeating is correct. Add up three, the 0.3 repeating to 0.3 repeating, 0.3 repeating, we get 0.9 repeating. For infinity, which is equal to one, exactly the same thing. Okay, let's talk about this. All right, that happened. <laughs> We got a couple more minutes. Let's talk about fractions. What are we going to do with fractions? Just punch it in the face. We're just going to put a face in the fraction. Yeah. Where it is. Uh, okay. So now it gets a little more abstract. It, it's not so much that I, why I have five times x, so I want one fifth of that. Right? Two fourths of x. So now it starts to go into how do we wind up with 1x plus nothing divided by 1, like all these things that don't change x. Right? They just they are equivalent to just 1x. Yeah. Multiply both sides by 4 and then divide both sides by 3. Yeah. I'll do that all at the same time. Right? Multiply by 4, you cancel out the denominator. Great. You have 3x, blah, blah, blah. Divide by 3. And you'll be done. Or you can do it all at the same time. Multiply by 4 and divide by 3 all at once. Maybe that never occurred to you that multiplying by a fraction is. What? Yeah. Yeah. Over here we get 12 over 12, or cross canceling, and we just ultimately end up with 1 times x. Over here, cross cancel, 3 with 15, that's 5 times 4. Did you guess that x was 20? Sure. Probably. At, at some point, you put this not quite right, I need a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, and I get my, you know, I work my way to 20, and uh, it worked. Great. It just won't work for very long. Or the amount of time it takes you to guess is much longer than just the, the time it takes to, to follow our algebraic approach. All right? One more. Just one more. almost exactly like this one, right? Except for it's not 3x, it's 4 fifths x. So we're not going to divide by 3, we're going to do something else at that stage. Justin? Well, wouldn't you subtract the 3 from the I factor? would. Mm -hmm. I would do that. Just do the same as the one previous and multiply this is by 20. 5 over 4. Multiply by 5 over 4. 5 over 4. Nice, 4 divides 24, we're left with 6 times 5, x is 30. The amount of time it would have taken you to guess that x was 30, doing that calculation over and over and over, until you got 27 exactly, it's much longer than what we just did. We took, you know, 5 seconds to find that x is 30. 